In Italy, for 30 years under the Borgias, they had warfare, terror, murder, bloodshed, but they produced Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, and the Renaissance. In Switzerland, they had brotherly love. They had 500 years of democracy and peace. And what did that produce? The cuckoo clock. Welcome, everyone, back to another edition of Let's Take Five, the podcast where we look at one of the greats of cinema and discuss their excellence and range. My name is Eric Martindale. My name's Austin Luger. And today we are continuing on with our Orson Welles Five. The previous films we covered was Citizen Kane. Nobody's ever heard of that film. Nope. The Third Man, where today we're going to talk about Othello. Uh, after this is Touch of Evil. Evil? Jeez, I can't talk today. And Chimes at Midnight. But today we're talking about Othello. Othello is a play by William Shakespeare. You might have heard of that mm-hmm. person. If you've heard of that person, you might have heard of this play, Othello. Pretty simple story, really. It's a story about a Venetian, well, a Moor, who is with the Venetians that take over a land called Cyprus. Um, that's not really what the play's about. The play's about Iago, who's one of the lieutenants of Othello, who's the Moor, who's sort of the general here, who basically plots against Othello, um, making, tricking uh, his him into thinking his wife Desdemona is cheating on him, eventually living, uh, leading to his downfall. Um, that's pretty much the play. There's not there's not too much nuance there, other than you know just Shakespeare's you know in general beautiful language. Um, so I'm going to just immediately turn to you, Austin, and say, what do you think of this film? I didn't love it. Yeah, I, I didn't love this one, and this is a really kind of so Orson Welles is a curious subject for us to do because with other subjects we've had, they're typically great for a really long time, and then maybe they kind of get, when they're older, Hollywood doesn't like focus on them as much. This is a part when Orson Welles is living in Europe because Hollywood hates him so much, mm-hmm. and he can't get anything made. So he's just kind of making his own thing um, basically on his own dime, and like it's kind of... Finest in different kind of ways. Well, the making of this film is more famous than the film. Yeah. So it, it's, a, it's a really kind of curious time for Orson Welles as an artist here. And I mean, even with the nice Criterion version, this is still definitely a movie made with lesser resources as like the audio is filmed separately, as all Italian films were at this time. Mm-hmm. But I also just don't love this period of Orson Welles as an artist in general. Um, I think this is one of his weaker films and because while I think his performance is very good I think actually every performance in this is rather great Mm -hmm. and the use of the sets and like actual landscape is incredible this has a real sloppiness in its film grammar um, where the editing seems off the pacing often seems off you will have these kind of beautiful shots that exist in a moment but not in the whole scene itself like it just kind of goes from, like, sloppy, sloppy, perfect shot, sloppy, sloppy, like, all in the same pan. Mm-hmm. And so that just kind of, it threw me off in that way where I go, I actually, I like the thing about this except for Orson Welles, the filmmaker. Okay. So it's it's not my favorite time for him, but there's so much also good to say about this film, but it just felt, it, it's sloppy. And then it was weird, as we discuss next week, to not see that sloppiness again. Um. So my, my... A take on it comes from a completely different angle. Um, Othello is one of my least favorite Shakespeare plays in general. Um, so Shakespeare has like 37 plays or something. I, I don't pretend to have to know them all or have read them all, but basically all the, the main big ones, and I would count Othello amongst those, sure. um, you know, the ones you actually have a chance at seeing somewhere. We're not good, We're not talking about... Measure um, for measure. Or, or Time of Athens or whatever. Oh, um, right. <laughs> you know, like, uh, you... I mean, there's so many Charleston Cressida and, you know, so many Coriolanus. Winter's um, Tale. Yeah, exactly. That you just don't see that often. Um, you'll see Othello. I mean, Othello will be done. Um, it's it's happening, and you have a chance to go out and see that. Um, and part of the reason why I don't necessarily love Othello is because um, for, it's, a, it's a twofold reason. One, because there doesn't seem to be much of a subplot to Othello. I mean, there's the expository part where they, you know, conquer Cyprus or whatever. And then it's pretty much scene by scene Iago just manipulating Othello into um, thinking that Desdemona is running around on him. Now, the more convinced Othello gets of her of her guilt, the more into madness he goes. But there is no addition to her crimes. Was that a more pun? 
Did I? The more I convinced. I the... It was not a more pun, okay. but it could be. Okay. We'll say pun intended. Mm-hmm. Um, but the more the more uh, Othello becomes convinced of her crimes, the more insane he gets. But there are never any addition to the crimes. The crime stays the same. She she was cheating on him, even though she wasn't. We know that. That's the dramatic irony. But it seems kind of weird that a guy would go that crazy over that. Yes. And and so that's that's one one. And second fold is Iago is never really given a reason for doing it. He other than just he hates Othello. We don't know why he hates Othello. We don't we we don't know why. We can presume oh it's because of, you know, power or something like that, which is so often the, the goals of so many villains in Shakespeare. But power as a means to what? What is he what is he seek to gain? He gets promoted to above Cassio during the film, but he continues to manipulate Othello. Why? And then the third part being, um, it almost feels like a play that has a lot cut out of it. Because when you see Shakespeare, um, so often you have a lot of subplots that are cut out of it. You'll see Macbeth frequently done without Macduff in it. And in the play, Macduff kills Macbeth. That's a pretty big part, right? Um, So you'll see that, you'll see that gone and that sort of thing. Othello doesn't really have those things. It doesn't have subplots or anything else going on. It's just pretty much specifically beat for beat for beat for beat leads us to the ending. And this is even a a cut down version of that. There are two versions of this movie. Both are between 90 and 95 minutes, Mm -hmm. which is rare for any Shakespeare movie, honestly. Yeah. Even every Much Ado adaptation hits the two-hour mark. And Macbeth is his shortest play. Yeah. And most of those are... You know, be super long. Yeah, times. super long. So, and it's really curious how that works because I've seen Othello on stage once, and I've seen two other movies of it. One was a set in a modern day high school basketball team. Josh so, Hartnett. Josh Hartnett. I mean, mm-hmm. it's part of the Hartnett canon. Well, we're going to get to Hartnett in our own five. So, <laughs> so the, we're, we're going to save that for the, that in the Pearl Harbor. Oh, right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so in. Versions I've seen, including on stage, they use the language sometimes to hint at more of an Iago motivation. Usually it is like you see a jealousy form kind of mm-hmm. from this, from the way they interpret the words and the actors. This movie does not see Iago as the main character of the movie. Which which is unfortunate because he's the main character of the play. He absolutely is. Mm-hmm. And that's what was very curious about that. You know, the guy who played Iago, his name is... Michael McLeamore, Malia Moore, a lot, lot of letters in that last name. Mm-hmm. Um, I think he's great. I think like because when you play a Machiavellian character, I, I thought a lot about House of Cards while watching his performance because naturally, there, of course, mm-hmm. there are two versions of House of Cards. There's the original British version and then the Kevin Spacey version. Um, and I've only seen the pilot for the original UK version, but. It's an old man. It's a guy who's been in public service for like many, many terms. He thought he was going to get the promotion he finally got. Didn't. And clearly just said, burn them all. <laughs> is now going to start a complex plot to ruin everyone's careers and have him succeed. And he's this old man who you don't, you wouldn't see it coming. Kevin Spacey is so hysterically evil, that's what people like the American version, that you should always suspect he's doing something. Like mm-hmm. he, he walks into the, the lunch room and you go, he's going to fuck me over. I don't even know how he's going to fuck me over. It's lunch. Um, but then he does because he's talking to the camera and he's smirking and he's evil as hell. This movie played Iago much more like the UK House of Cards. Like, I thought he really could have been like a Snidely Whiplash kind of thing, but he actually just seemed like an advisor who was trying to help Othello by telling this kind of stuff. Like, he had a low key element to him that I thought was really good and convincing and a lot of those things are always trying to provide more context for iago because it's context that simply doesn't exist in the play yeah i mean and so that's really interesting i mean aside from like not having the side plots i mean you have and uh macbeth you have like i said you have macduff who's cut and and midsummer night's dream you have the rude mechanicals that don't affect the plot at all they Mm -hmm. just show up and do a funny play at the end i mean that's it um it's literally just focused on this guy manipulating this person, and you don't know why they're doing it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I will say the Michael McLemore or whatever his name is, he, he grew on me as the play, or this play, as the movie went went, went along. Um, uh, you know, it was kind of trending in a certain way, where it was like, oh man, Orson Welles is like amazing in this. And then somewhere along the line, I was like, oh no, I think, I think this guy playing Iago is actually quite good in his own right. Um, but 
we've kind of it's kind of interesting because we're kind of avoiding talking about. Or, or I don't know if we're doing it intentionally, but we haven't actually talked about Orson Welles in this movie, though. Well, is there a reason for that? There, yes and no. Uh, one, I always, always like Iago more, so I want yeah. to talk about him first. Um, second, that you have to address the issue of every single adaptation of Othello uh, before, I don't know, the year 1970, probably. Of, yeah, the, the more is a black person. That is in the play. As, as mm-hmm. More even is. Um, so, yeah, it's Orson Welles in blackface. And I remember I was watching it, and I forgot. Well, I hadn't seen the movie, so I just assumed it was Iago because of Juicy Apart. I go, "Oh no, of course he won't be the the, the more powerful like figure or whatnot." Um, so I was happy that it was more subtle blackface. It was. It, it was. It, it was actually. It looks it like it wasn't he's more, uh, like golden. Right. It was yeah. even like because the film isn't like super high budget. It even just looks just like it's a shadow sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm watching this. I'm like. It was never distracting in a way that every blackface typically is distracting. Um, but I was watching it, and Sarah walked in. I go, "Is this like more subtle blackface? Is this, like better than usual?" And she's like, "Richard said all blackface is bad." I go, "Oh yeah, <laughs> that was dumb me to say." <laughs> but it's it's <laughs> it's passive blackface. Yeah. yeah okay. But it's kind of funny because like for the Immortals, we reviewed a a really nice French film called Children of Paradise, and one of the major four characters is an actor. And it's his dream to, like, get a, a part worthy of, like, the talent he's trying to build up. And the final act, he gets to play Othello. It actually is, like, a triumphant thing. But he is in blackface the last few scenes. But, like, it's weirdly okay. But I now own two criterions of blackface Othello, which is very specific. But What is the other one? Children Paradise. Oh, it's still yeah. this? Okay. Um, but that said... Because you just like, you have to like make that like it has to be but, yeah be for must sure. be talked about. Orson Welles is is very curiously good in this because the last two films we covered, you have his character succeed in a powerful way because of charisma and the way he talks. Um, even though this movie is all set in Shakespearean verse, that is not what makes Othello compelling. It is his presence. And there's something truly royal about how he positions himself and how he moves around that is so different from Kane and, and Harry Lyme that was always very impressive to me. What do you think? And also, uh, that even is more effective in the second half of Othello when all of that starts to fall apart, right? Yeah. Yeah, we usually see Othello in this film sort of looming over people or he's at the top of the stairs while the camera's looking or he's on top of some great wall or something. He's always put in a position of, like, authority. And then you see him brought really low by Iago in the second part of um, the movie. Um, no, definitely, yeah. There's also a way about speaking Shakespeare clearly and speaking it... Um, natural naturalistically to where I'm having a conversation with you right now and I'm speaking and um I am a pentameter I and thought, it yeah. and I can perfectly understand and follow what you're saying. I mean you're not gonna get every word because it's Shakespeare, but you know, so much of Shakespeare is also you delivering naturally and you're responding emotionally correctly and you understand the nuance even when you didn't necessarily understand the word. Um and Orson Wells is fantastic at that. The whole cast was yeah, like, yeah. I mean, it's not just, like, the acting, but just the way it was filmed. You just forget almost in the first minute. Because typically with every Shakespeare play, I always say, like, the first page or so, if I'm watching it live, is me adjusting my brain to how it's it's going. Yeah, no, no, yeah, I'm with it. That was never here. And that almost threw me off how much, like, it's a half hour and I go, oh, yeah, these are crazy sentences. Like, like, (laughs) that just had, like, 15 commas in it, but I just never noticed Mm -hmm. at all. um, Because... Because it's such a short movie, even though I do find the editing to be really, really Was choppy, there a specific part you're thinking of? Honestly, the whole movie. Like, the yeah. whole movie was like, are these scenes, like... Because it's like, he's so, like... The, 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 Kane is so perfect, where, like, every editing choice is, like... The whole movie's storyboard is so perfectly regular. Like, this is connecting to this. Like, every single edit is, like, perfectly designed by Orson Welles. This one just felt like... Oh, we'll, we'll decide what this looks like in post in a way that did not 
and it works the same way it worked for like Malik. I'm See, like, I, I had a problem with the audio more just because Italian cinema at this time well, was rough. Chimes of Midnight has the same problem. Yeah. So um, also whatever he did in Europe. Yeah. Yeah. So that obviously has something to do with it, and there are some editing things in Chimes too. When we get to that, although I think Chimes is a much better movie than this, um, I still liked it. I feel like I liked it. Um, because I, I I'm not I'm not a, I don't love Shakespeare on film, you know. The only times I've really dug it are typically when they have been s- filmed stage versions of the play. Mm-hmm. Um, everyone has to come with some new twist or new adaptation, and sometimes I feel like that becomes those bells and whistles come. Oh, become, they're samurais. Yeah, it's, <laughs> what? A, oh, no. oh. that's different though. <laughs> I know. Um, so actually, I want to talk about that. Okay. So what Austin's referring to is Kurosawa. Who did Ron, which is King Lear. Which we covered. And Throne of Blood, which is Macbeth, which we didn't. Mm -hmm. Um, The difference is that's not Shakespeare's language. That's Shakespeare's story. Yeah. I mean, I could could write an adaptation of King Lear, too, and so could you. I could take the same beats in the story, and it would not be Shakespeare's, and do my own thing on it. But when you're actually taking Shakespeare's language... um, and you take out the setting and, and you take out of the, the position the characters were actually in at that time. You start to do something different and using the same language. That always comes off as bullshit to me. It mm. just always has. Um, I'm not interested in your um, Romeo and Juliet where the Capulets are white people and the Matthews are black people. And it's the 1950s in America in the South. Like I don't, I don't, that doesn't really do Unless anything for me. they're singing. <laughs> is uh, Sondheim songs? Uh, no, and, and no Sondheim songs, please. Uh. No, I'm just it, like that. That doesn't do anything, and that and that's your cup of tea. That's fine, but I always feel like the best Shakespeare versions are or Shakespeare plays are the ones that just try to present it as a, the text intends it. Like mm-hmm. I, I, the '60s Romeo and Juliet's really good. Yeah, um, this Othello I like, um, and I avoid li- Olivier's stuff just because I'm not in love with him in general. I, I hear his Richard the Third is excellent. I do like his stuff. I mean, I like a lot of Branagh. Um, I love Branagh's Hamlet. Um, mm-hmm. Like it's Henry V quite a bit. Well, see, my problem with Branagh's Hamlet is he's too old to play Hamlet. Hamlet, uh, yeah. Hamlet should be like eighteen. Or I don't buy his manipulation. It's like I feel like it, there has to be an air of immaturity to Hamlet to sort of pull that off, and I mm-hmm. don't think Branagh pulls it off. I can see that. Um, that said, as far as a film version of Hamlet, that is it's probably the best. Mm-hmm. Um, but then, like, the Hall of Crown series, you know, that's great. And it's presenting it like it's a history, right? And that's all really good. Yeah, man, uh, it's good. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really damn good. Um, so I, I don't get into – as far as, like, a filmed Othello version, I mean, you talked about O earlier with Josh Hartnett taking place in a high school. Yuck. Like, that, I hate that. Um, it's, to me, it feels like sort of a ba- bastardization. But this – to me, this would be like, okay, this is the filmed Othello version. I know people like the Lawrence Fishburne one too, but I, I, I would – I like this one. I think Lawrence Fishburne won a little bit more just because I like Lawrence Fishburne more, and I like it like, had a tighter filming. This is oh, I like Lawrence Fishburne as a fellow oh, more. Don't oh, get me oh, wrong. No, but I, 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 I like obvious him. reasons. Yeah. Uh, there's there's one fellow like I always like wish I could have seen uh, just because I'm such a fan of The Wire because of course I am mm. I'm the guy of the podcast. I, it's, I I have to like The Wire, <laughs> um, but they had um, Dominic West and Clark Peters who was uh, McNulty mm. and. Um, not Daniels, Jesus, uh, Lester Freeman, mm. uh, on The Wire. They did Othello at the West End for like a couple months. That'd be amazing. Would have been, I would have loved to see that because those two actors are incredible. Yeah. But that's right up there with Patrick Stewart and Ian McKellen and uh, uh, Waiting for Godot, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, at least they filmed that one. Yeah, I haven't watched it though. Either so. But anyway, but yeah, <laughs> getting, back, getting, getting back to this. Um, so, yeah, I mean, also I think you're totally right. Some of the cuts feel really weird, but at the same time, I almost felt like the locations we were always bouncing for were so, like, excellent that I, I, I think it kind of disguised it a bit for me. That, because the yeah. shots are – there's beautiful shots in this film. Um, the, 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 particularly, you're, like, up high on the wall, you know, and you're looking out over the ocean, oh and that's God. really neat. And yeah. then it makes a weird jump cut yeah. somewhere, and that happens. It has a very poorly filmed chase scene in it. And I, and I think that probably that probably did it for me. And the ADR is really bad too, which we discussed. But it's not an ugly movie. No, it's not. It's just like to me, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's beautiful. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's beautiful. And it's just not what I typically think of when I think of Wells, who is so all encompassing in every aspect of a movie. Mm-hmm. Typically, when that's working for him, every aspect works so well. So, and so it's weird. It's weird to see him slip because I think. 
I don't know why. I think maybe it's just the myth he created for himself. He almost feels like an all or nothing kind of filmmaker. Like this is either going to be a masterpiece or I got fucked. <laughs> well, the, the, so I talked about a little bit of it. And I don't know too much about it myself, but apparently the history of the, the making of this film is insane. It took them several years to make it. Oftentimes they didn't get the right props and, and whatnot, so they had to put trash cans and then put a cape over them around like garb to sub. <laughs> as, yeah, like uh, a lot of the statuary doesn't make sense. It's not uh, a lot of the places they are don't don't sort of fit in anachronistically and stuff like that. Stuff that I wouldn't know. But, I didn't know. Dramaturg or someone like that, some or some Shakespeare elite would would certainly pick up on stuff like that. Um, you know, other than the big glaring thing, no one seemed to notice that there was a white man playing a <laughs> black man. <laughs> that was strange. <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, um, I, I thought it, I thought it was good. It's fine. I'm glad we picked it. In hindsight, maybe we should have gone with something else different because we're going to be doing Shakespeare at the end of this anyway. Well, I mean, I this is way better than his Macbeth, which I don't like at all. I haven't seen his Macbeth. It is. A mess. It almost feels like, it almost feels like he had like renew his uh, director's guild card. It was like cause the whole movie is like basically on a sound stage, and like it's really hard to understand what the hell's going on. The whole mm-hmm. movie, like, the same sound stage. Like they're not moving around. <laughs> it's the same. Like even set. if you go in knowing Macbeth backwards and forwards, which I feel like pretty much everyone does at this point, you're still confused on what's going on. Yeah, but <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I didn't love that one, but um, I don't. Know, he, he just has. The middle of his career is just so odd. Like, like he did uh, the trial with um, um, Anthony Perkins. Like he did Franz Kafka's mm-hmm. The Trial, uh, which is a curious, but also like hard to find a good copy of that nowadays. Um, like some of his films, because he got so blackballed by the system, they you need a criterion to kind of make some of these old prints look watchable. Yeah, Mr. Arcadian, you know, like weird stuff in the middle of his career. Yeah. But, well, I mean, even that's kind of like the tragedy of Orson Welles, right? I don't right. think people look at him as like a, a happy story. I think no. people, people go, wow, you peaked really early, then everybody hated you, you had to leave the country. So even if you made a good film, no one cared. And you just get fatter and grosser. And you just get fatter, <laughs> and, right? And your last big moments of fame are... Uh, you drunk for a wine commercial in the Transformers animated in the Transformers <laughs> animated movie, yeah. which everyone everyone seems to say is great, excellent. I've so. never seen it because I can't follow any of the Transformers stuff. <laughs> um, I'm done. We do. I don't have anything else to add. All right. It was Othello. Yeah. If you know Othello, you've you're, you're five steps ahead. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna you're gonna have a fine time with yeah. this film. But yeah. Othello. <laughs> anyway, uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts on Othello. This is one of your favorite adaptations of Othello. Is this a... Are you excited about kind of Orson Welles' career right now? Let us know what you think over at theartamoral.com. Leave a comment there on the Othello page. Also, while you're there, check out some other spiffy podcasts like Ad Absurdum, which talked about Inception, where the pop culture legal team discussed the real-life legal implications of what happens if you can do corporate espionage and dreams. Also, uh, The Immortals is about to end its one-month hiatus, um, but as you wait for the episode next week, you can uh, listen to episode 100, where it's uh, Adam's final episode. He reviewed Lion King and Spice Girls and stuff. You know, fun stuff. The usual. The usual. Where can we find you? Uh, Constant Diversion is my YouTube channel. You can check me out on there. Um, otherwise, that's the only place you can find me. All right. We'll catch you all next week when we're going to be reviewing Touch of Evil. Until then, I'm Austin Luger. I'm Eric Martindale. Bye, everyone. bye bye Villain, be sure thou proves my love a whore. Be sure of it. Give me the ocular proof. Or by the worth of man's immortal soul, I'd been better have been born a dog. Gun answer my wake trough. Oh, Grace. Make me to see it, or at the least so prove it that the probation bear no hinge nor loop to hang a doubt on. No woe upon my life. Never pray more. Abandon all remorse. For nothing canst thou to damnation add. Greater than that. Oh, monstrous world. Take no, take no world. To be direct and honest is not safe. By the world. I think my wife be honest and think she is not. I think that thou art just and think thou art not. I'll have some proof. Her name that was as fresh as Diane's visage is now begrimed and black as mine own face. Would I was satisfied. Oh, satisfied, my lord. Would you, the supervisor, grossly gape on?
behold her. Top <gasps> Where satisfaction? It is impossible you should see this. Where there's prime as goats, as hot as monkeys. Give me a living reason she's disloyal. 